So we're going to go over some general stuff and also some stuff that's really important for um, exotics care in our hospital. And these are the basic topics that we're going to try and cover in a really quick period of time. Um, and hopefully if you have any questions or queries or you want to go over any of the practical stuff that we touch on today, then we can do that um, during, you know, during the day when you guys are on and hopefully when we're all not too busy. So um, we are going to go through... Um, most of the things that we, most of the animals that we see in hospital, we're going to go through handling, and then how to set them up in hospital, um, and what they um, typically eat, or what we're hoping that we're going to feed them in hospital, um, and then there's some bits and pieces at the end as well. Okay, so I just did a whole bunch of TAFE lessons in bird handling, and um, this was one of my slides. So the question to the TAFE students was, which there's two pictures that are correct handling techniques and one that's wrong. Which is the wrong one? This one? The one on the right? One in the middle? Anybody think that's wrong? No. Very good. So that's correct for a pigeon. If you hold a pigeon in any other way, um, in front of a pigeon fancier, I think you're mad. Um, pigeons kind of like being held like that. They sit there in your hand and you can do almost anything. You can tip them upside down and they're just like, bo-bo. Um, this is the wrong one. If you held a bird of any size um, for any length of time like this, it would die. Um, two reasons. It'll get too hot. And the second reason is that it won't be able to breathe. Birds don't have diaphragms. So remember, if you hold a bird um, and put pressure on anywhere except around its neck, so anywhere on its body, it won't be able to breathe. It just cannot inflate um, all of its air sacs and its lungs. So, um, because obviously with a diaphragm, that's the muscles that inflates your lungs. So this method here, although it looks a kind of barbaric, is actually the correct way. And this is how we're going to hold all our birds in hospital for any kind of um, exam, a physical exam, or any kind of treatment. So our only problem is that we have legs that kind of flick around and wings that potentially flap about. But the good part about holding them like this is that hopefully you've got a towel. You've got a big bit of towel maybe on this side that you can kind of wrap around their body so that their, their wings don't flap out. Um, and their, their legs can easily be restrained either by me while I'm handling um, or by you with your other hand or by somebody else who's walking by and just sees us struggling a lot. Um, <laughs> But the thing to remember about bird handling, the really important thing to remember is that I don't want to get bitten. <laughs> and neither do you, really. Um, and the way to stop that is to hold like this. So can you see that the fingers and thumbs are actually sitting underneath the jawbone? Okay, so they're actually pushing up here. The thumb is the most important finger. pushes up the jawbone like that. And if you can push on the jawbone of the bird, you can actually push their head back. You can't break their neck. You won't, yeah, unless you superhuman strength but if you push their head up like that they can't actually move their head and you can really extend their neck quite a lot um, which which works to restrain them if you hold them on their jaw bones like just on here it's really uncomfortable for them um, and they they would try and get away they they push their head away um, and any species that ha doesn't have feathers on their cheeks so can anybody think of one species a macaw a macaw, um, typically, like the cheapest macaw that is going to come into our hospital um, might cost the owner about $1,500. The most expensive could be up to twenty dollars or $30,000. If you go and hold a macaw around its jaw bones, you will bruise it, for sure. And if You've bruised one before. And so if you hand back the $30,000 macaw to the owner with bruised cheeks, he's not going to be very happy. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so this, is, this is the way of, of not doing that. And if you always remember that you can move your thumb up under the jawbone like that, just to sort of do this to their head, um, then you won't get bitten because they can't put their head down to bite you. So it's something that we probably all need to practice. Um, and I probably should have had my chickens here so that we could practice, but we don't really have time to do the practical stuff. But if you get the opportunity and let's say there is a chicken or a pigeon or something that's not too bitey in hospital, maybe we can, we can practice that kind of handling technique a little bit more. Any questions on handling? Always use a towel, by the way. There are some um, practitioners that sort of say, don't use towels because they get too hot. In fact, it's the other way around. 
your hand is very, very hot, and so the towel will kind of protect them from that heat a lot as well. Okay, so bird setup. This is being done really well, I have to say, in, in hospital. And when I first started working here with, um, with no like, specialised nurse or nursing staff, I was a little bit like, oh, how's this going to go? But it's amazing. You guys do an amazing job. Um, but I just thought we'd go over a couple of things. Um, I'm kind of going to push via security a lot because of a couple of reasons. Um, because in, in the exotics ward we're going to have multiple different species and, and it seems a lot of multiple different species, we really need to think about disease and disease transfer. And there are some diseases that we can catch as well from our exotic patients. Um, so it really needs, we, it has to be in the forefront of our brains all the time. So uh, F10 is, my, is the chosen product for cleaning um, because it does have antibacterial, antifungal and, and um, they think it's pretty good on viruses as well. Um, it works better if it's left to dry, but that doesn't mean that you should just spray down a cage with a whole bunch of poo in it and leave it to dry. It only works if you get rid of the organic material in the cage. So you need to wipe it down with F10, get rid of the organic material, that means poo, food, vomit, get rid of it all. And then if you think or suspect an infectious disease, um, then you can just give it a little light spray and leave it to dry. That's fine. And that goes for food bowls as well. They can be left to dry with F10. Um, there shouldn't be any remnants of faeces, vomit or food scraps in any of the cages like in the morning. So if we can feed it, when we're feeding and cleaning, just really give it a good clean um, because birds and reptiles, I guess, have a really bad, or all of them, have a really bad habit of eating where they've pooed. Um, and it, some birds will even eat their own poo um, for whatever reason. So um, it is just important to do that. And they do need fresh food and water every day, um, with really no exceptions. Um, so what I think, the one thing that we can change is how much food we're putting in the cage. Um, probably don't put a whole bowl of seed in a cage with a budgie because it would be nicer if we gave a small amount of seed each day and cleaned it out every day. Um, because they do, again, poo um, stuff in there and vomit and stuff in their food bowl. It's one of the most common presentations in my consult room is birds with um, sort of really mild respiratory disease, runny noses and stuff, and it's usually pseudomonas that causes that, and they get that from dirty water bowls and dirty food bowls, and these owners are saying to me, but I've cleaned the food bowls almost every day, but they're probably not just not cleaning them enough. So there should never be any slime inside the water bowl. They need to be wiped out properly with hot water, um, using a scrub brush or, a t or a, even just paper towel, wet paper towel um, while you're running water over it to really scrub it out. So I shouldn't ever put my finger in a water bowl after an animal's been in for a week and find slime in there because we're going to be giving that bird pseudomonas. All right, and this is what um, setups kind of should look like. This is an eclectus parrot. This was his own basket, so it was just his you know, comfort blanket, basically. Nice fresh food, fruits. Um, but oftentimes birds will come in and they don't all eat pellets um, and, and it's the same as the, con like the converse, they don't all eat seed. So it's, um, if I haven't been thorough on my history taking and asked them exactly what they eat at home, then it's good to just put a little bit of seed and a little bit of pellets in there. Um, they might not eat the pellets that we've got. We've got Harrison's and Vetter Farm typically, but um, so putting in seed and pellets is really important, small amounts of both. Um, and fruit and veg. Uh, this is actually what Sophia made as her, one of her projects while she was here. You know, Sophia, the Portuguese student. She sent me a Portuguese cookbook yesterday. I know, she sent me another uh, present as well. She's awesome. Um, lovely girl, and she made this for me to, to be in my consult room also. Um, and it says galar diet, but really this kind of goes for almost every parrot species that we have in hospital. Um, so... Ideally, their ideal diet would be made up of mostly fresh vegetables um, and, and grasses and things like that. Most of the seed-eating birds in the wild will eat grass as well. Uh, and then pellets, grass seeds, grains and sprouts, and that includes the, all the seeds that we feed as well, should be the next thing. Some parrots will eat fruit, so if they're a fruit-eating bird, it should be the next thing. Um, some birds, even the the parrots will eat some insects, um, some like uh, macaws and stuff actually are given chicken bones sometimes for the added calcium and, and fat in the marrow. 
um, and you can feed egg and eggshells to some species. And then things like bread, pasta, cereals, co- anything cooked um, are all treats and, and really should only be fed you know, once a month or something like that. So this is kind of good to know if people are asking you about bird diets also. Um, and I will have these photocopied for maybe for, um, for clients so that we can use them as client education. It's good for us to remember though as well. Okay, <clears throat> so reptile handling. Um, I do have a snake in hospital that came from the market. Um, yeah, do you want to see if it's, if, it's, if, if it's feisty and not that handleable, then don't bring it down, but if it's happy... We can maybe do a little prack, <laughs> prack snake. Yeah, it's a pet snake. It's pretty, pretty tame, um, and it's just a, an olive python. But we can at least show you how to hold a snake's head. This is not how you hold a snake, because this is not going to go well. <laughs> okay, so if you came to any of the emergency um, reptile uh, things that I did, you'll know how to hold these guys. Um, this is probably the, where people are going to be a little bit um, scared or a little bit, you know, wary, um, especially if we had something that was poisonous. But really, um, I, I think I've already said that, you know, re- venomous reptiles in the hospital is just really not going to happen. I think we probably need to say no to, to the brown snakes and the black snakes. But on occasion, we're going to get a wildlife species come in. But um, if we were in a, in a situation where we just had to, I don't know what, when that would arise, or for interest sake, I guess, for everybody, this is um, my, uh, the ideal way of dealing with a, a venomous snake. Um, this is a clear tube, um, and you can get them as sets, I think, from like URS, like the reptile people. Um, and it's got, a, it's got a, um, um, a clear end, but it's sealed at the end. And so you basically just put the tube on the floor and you use a snake um, hook, yes, and like kind of direct the snake into this tube and it runs up the tube and then you hold it um, down this end, hold the snake and the tube all at the same time and then you can kind of look at the snake and if you need you know, to look the, the body up higher then you can pull the snake out gradually. But basically you choose the, the diameter of the tube um, for the snake so that it can't turn around and get you. But snakes like going into things, so this works quite well. It also works well for a bitey um, python, because you don't really want to get bitten. Um, this is a, a death adder, which you'll never have to deal with. Um, but, you know, like, obviously, it, it gives us a good idea, because the, the, um, the adder species have these huge heads. So you can see, it's the same as bird handling, right? You want to get behind the jaws. Because if you hold them on the head, um, I had this terrible experience... <laughs> In Nepal, we did a lot of work with some cobras, some spectacled cobras that had all had their venom glands punctured. They all should have been euthanized, really, but um, it's very difficult to explain that to a Buddhist nation to euthanize. And <clears throat> somebody was handling the cobra who wasn't very experienced but was trying to learn. It was a terrible situation. But anyway, he was holding it, and cobras have this really cool knack of being able to like displace their teeth almost, and it kind of did this. Uh, and its pangs were coming around to it. this guy's fingers, which were like not quite in the right place, not in this place. They were just sort of up here more. Anyway, he obviously was going to get bitten, and he dropped the snake, and he did get bitten, but it was a dry bite, thank goodness, because we were way too far away from any hospital to give us anti-venom. Um, and we had a whole heap of kids from the village standing around because they just used to come and watch us do what we were doing. And, Anyway, we had this loose cobra. So you don't want that. And I don't want that in my consult room or in the hospital, even with a diamond python, because, you know, it's just difficult to catch and it's just annoying, really. So um, that is the correct way to hold a snake, nice and firm around the back of the, the, the jaw bones there. The other really common species we'll see is the, the dragon, um, bearded dragons. We've got one in hospital at the moment. They really like to be supported. If you pick them up, kind of like that, they're going to do this, flail around, their tail is going to flick around, it's going to hurt you. um, So always put your hand underneath them and lift them up from the bottom. And most of the time when I'm doing treatments, um, you'll still need to hold them like that. Um, This is a good way with a small dragon, just using a couple of fingers to push down just at the back of the head there. And they kind of can move their body, but they can't push up to walk. Um, 
And I haven't got a really good picture of taking blood from a, a dragon, but taking blood, you need to hold them up vertically like that, and it, it's a kind of knack to get used to. But if you hold their front legs to their body like this and their back legs to their tail, they can't move. They're just kind of like this. So, and that's quite a good way if we ever had a really big... Let's say the Komodo dragon came in that day. <laughs> um, we, we got a call on, the, on Saturday about a Komodo dragon. Um, we would actually tape, use electrical tape, to tape their front legs to their body and their back legs to their tail. And then they can't really move and then you can kind of do what you need to do. Um, with them. Sure. So setting up a reptile, again the biosecurity is important. Um, I guess everybody's probably heard that reptiles carry salmonella. Yeah, Not all reptiles carry salmon the salmonella species that we are worried about. So, um, so it's not like we're all going to get salmonella and die you know, of some horrible bacterial infection. But it is something to keep in mind and so washing your hands every time you touch or handle a reptile or, or clean their cage is very important. F10, again, is very important in cleaning, and the tanks should be wiped out every day or every second day. Um, if there's any sign of pooing, so sometimes it won't be at faecal, it'll just be some urates, the paper needs to be changed. Um, and even if there's no defecation or urination, um, the paper needs to be changed every second day, as a rule. Okay. Um, Fresh food and water every day. Everybody who's done the terrarium so far knows the water dries out or the food dries out within hours. So um, at least every day the food needs to be replaced. And again, you don't need to feed like a huge amount of food, but we just need to kind of keep it fresh so that they are interested in eating it. Um, every day they need like fresh green, like a chopped salad, um, not snakes. So skinks and dragons need like a chopped salad every day probably with a little bit of AD and insectivore mix sprinkled over it. Um, and then every few days we can offer insects. And for a, a dragon or a skink that's inappetent, insects will hopefully get them started on eating. So we can offer that more regularly if we think that's needed. Um, hopefully we're going to get another thermostat, but if anybody ever finds a thermostat that has now gone missing, it'd be really great to get it back. But thermometers and thermostats are really important because we need to know how hot our tank is um, because that's actually part of the medicine of reptiles, keeping their environment at a certain temperature. Um, and I found a really good document the other day that has the ideal temperatures for a whole bunch of really common species which we'll put up in the, um, in the ward so that we can get an idea of, of what we're looking at in our tanks. If, it, if you're using the big terrarium, we like to have a gradient, so one end that's cooler than the other. Um, and yeah, and, and you'll work that out. And the thermometer that we've got has two probes, so you can put one at one end and one at the other end, and then you'll actually know what your gradient is, which is good. Is it Feist? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's not trying to bite. No, no, no. Um, so always knowing where their head is before you ha put your hand in the bag is a good thing. I don't know. We'd have to sex it. Okay, so see how the, ad the adder has such a, a much bigger head than this girl or guy. Um, but you can still get your fingers just at the base of the, of the head there. And she can't pull back and she can't actually move her head side to side, which is what I was saying about the, the teeth kind of coming out like that. Um, but if I was holding her up on the top of the head, my finger would be like really, really close. If I held any higher up, I'd be very close to the edge of her, her mouth, um, and I would get bitten. See, that's what happened with the tape when they were teaching us how to hold them. Yeah. Similar to what you're doing now, yep. further forward on the actual head, mm -hmm. that's what it did. It started turning around, as you said before, with a cobra, yeah. and I said, it's going to get me. It's a let go, and it swiped back and got me. Got you, yeah. So, so if you're dealing with a poisonous snake, then you'll get bitten like that, for sure. A lapids are, have an amazing ability to move their teeth. Um, and she, I mean, she's more um, relaxed when she's wrapping around me, and that's fine. But if I, um, like at Mogo, we had a reticulated python that was 
almost as long as this room. It required eight people to hold that thing down. Um, and you don't want that to wrap. So you've just got to, you know, work out your patient. If this snake was double the size, I probably wouldn't want it wrapping around my hand because it's going to cut the circulation off and I'll be like, ow. Um, so this is another way of doing it, but I'm holding quite tight. And you have to remember in birds and reptiles, they do have a complete, uh, their trachea has complete tracheal rings. So there's no cartilage in the, tr in the trachea. So you can almost squish as hard as you want and you won't, they won't die of asphyxiation. Snakes particularly are hard to asphyxiate because obviously they have to move their trachea around to be able to eat those massive, the massive prey. Um, pardon? Not yet, no. No, I didn't want her eating before I did this to her. Did she get all relaxed? No, she vomited up and we'd all be grossed out by that. Um, where are we up to there? Oh yeah, we need to just make sure that we've always got heat lamps. Um, so if they fail, then we probably, uh, I was thinking about this, we might make a, I don't know, somewhere where we can put that we've, you know, we've lost another heat lamp so that we don't run out and we end up with having a reptile in hospital with no heat lamps. Um, we just need to make sure we've always got a supply. So Yeah, so in that big terrarium, like yesterday when that reptile first came in, I had it on all both lamps on, um, but we've just changed one of the heat lamps to a UV lamp because this, oh, that's the other thing. If, a rep, if one of the skinks or dragons are in for a long period of time, then we do need to supply them with UV. So this, this dragon's going to be in for at least a week, so we have one UV lamp and one heat lamp, and it seems to be a relatively good gradient. But that terrarium is, remember, all glass, and so it's going to lose heat. So if we're finding that, we can even wrap um, part of the terrarium in a blanket, the hot end, and keep it really warm. Yeah. We just have to be a bit creative, I think, at the moment. <laughs> How would you regulate your UV lamps if they adequately changed every six months? Um, that is also a good question. So we're going to need, like, a little, I think, a book with, like, um, just some paper that we can write when we put the, heat, the UV in and then what date we need to change it. Because Yasmina brings up a good point. At six months, the, if the UV light has been used solidly for six months, then um, the UV in it, just, just there's none left. So the, the bulb will still be glowing, but there'll be no UVB coming out of it. And UVB is the one that we want. So um, what, we, what we'll probably do is say, the UV will probably be gone in a year because we're not going to be using it full time um, and then replace that bulb even if it's not blown. Um, we do have insects in the, in the hospital. They're now in exotic wards, so we hopefully won't have any es escapees of wood cockroaches, but we've got mealworms and we've got woodies, um, so we shouldn't need to buy in insects, which is good. Insectivore mix is what I use to mix in with AD to make a higher protein, um, high fat diet for skinks and dragons, um, but we can also use that mix to tube feed snakes if we need to, and turtles. Oh, and obviously the salad mix every day is important. Um, at the zoo when I used to do food prep, um, we always used to say that uh, obviously the greens were the basis and then we had to have one, at least one red vegetable so that they absorbed the good, good stuff out of the green vegetables because there's good stuff in the red as well. And then um, we cho choose one type of fruit and we chop up the red vegetable and a little bit of apple or a little bit of banana and we'd then toss it through the salad. So it's actually a tossed salad. And we'd make it look pretty because that was, you know, that's what the zoo's all about, right? <laughs> Making things look pretty. Um, okay, ferret handling. This is also one that kind of stumps people. Most people don't really want to help me with the ferret because they're going to get bitten. Um, there are a couple of ways to handle them that you reduce your risk of getting bitten, but I can't say that these are... Like you, there's always a chance. Um, they're relatively strong animals, and they have the ability to kind of wriggle around and move their heads. And it is hard. I'll, you know, always give you that. So towels come in handy, but these are the two ways that we're probably going to be handling them. If they're really, really, really full on, then scruffing them might help. <laughs> But you always have to remember that as soon as you let go of that scruff, they will turn around like lightning and bite you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so putting them back and getting your hand away from them really quickly is important. Or like kind of wrapping them in a towel and like getting your hand out and putting them back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was that? 
<laughs> scream, <laughs> scream and run away. Yeah, um, yeah but if they're fi- we haven't had any feisty ones, but if they're really feisty, like they're really feisty and Some can't do much about it. Yeah, yeah, in play, but that's not as bad as a munch, 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 <laughs> like they do when they're really... <laughs> I had to, the, one, the worst bite I've had, uh, my nurse had to pry off its jaws from my fingers as it was like... <laughs> um, but this way, if you really... Um, th- this is actually quite a good way, and because I've got that kind of skinny neck, you can grab their whole neck, like all around their neck, and kind of like... Yeah, stop them from getting to you. And that's my preferred way. That's how I hold, hold them. Um, that's how, how you can hold an otter as well. Have you ever had that experience with two hands around their neck like that? And like, eh. And you can do almost anything. Um, so that's why I hold a ferret like that. Um, and it's good with a towel as well to do it that way. Ferret setup is really easy. Just treat it like a kitten. You shouldn't have any problems with ferrets in hospital. And in fact we probably should be setting them up in cat ward. Like, that's how similar they are. Um, they don't, we don't give them cat food, though. Does anybody know why? They need a much higher protein level in their diet and a higher fat level in their diet. Um, so we feed them kitten food and kitten kibble because we don't have any ferret food, ferret kibble here. And to be honest, it would go out of date before we use it because most people feed kitten food and kitten kibble or fresh meat. Um, we're not going to feed fresh meat in hospital because it's an oh and risk, um, but it's also a salmonella risk for the patient. So, um, so we, if, if you want to offer some ch- cooked chicken on occasion, that's okay, that's fine, but it's not going to be the main source of their food. Litter trays are important because they're always, almost always litter trained and they're really fastidious creatures even though they smell bad. Um, so it is really important to keep their litter trays clean um, and their blankets relatively clean. But in saying that, um, they are a muster lid and they, they really focus on scent. And so if you put a clean, when you put a clean blanket in, it'll be moments before it smells again because they'll just let out their scent glands and um, you know, smoosh it all over the blanket. So, yeah, we can keep their smell down to a minimum, but it's still going to be stinky. Um, but they do like to be cleaned, so really making sure that they're cleaned regularly is important. Okay, rabbit handling. If you're carrying a rabbit around the hospital, you should always carry it like this with their head kind of tucked in. Um, you can see calm animal, agitated animal. An agitated animal is likely to kind of jump out this way, even if you're holding them like that. So a hand on the top of their head is really important. The other thing you can do in Europe, this was interesting to me. I had a student once when I was at Camden say that <clears throat> they even did dentals awake by like holding their ears. It's kind of a bit weird. That, not removing teeth, just burring. Anyway, since then, um, if I had a really, really you know, stressed animal that, um, that just wants to jump and, and be full on, I do put like a light grip around the base of the ears and, and also you know, and use that as my hand to put pressure on their back. And it works quite well. Kind of, it's almost like a scruff in a rabbit. So that's one possibility. Um, this is a lab rabbit. There's no rabbit in my world that's going to sit like that while I put an IV catheter in. Um, <laughs> but that's a really good uh, method of wrapping them, and that's kind of how I wrap them when I'm doing a dental exam. I wrap them up really, really tight so that they can't do this and, and wiggle around. And when we're anaesthetizing them sometimes, if, if this isn't enough, you know, holding them on the table like that, we can wrap them really tightly, and I can just get the needle in under the towel. Um, but, yeah, uh, the... the, um, the, old, the I guess what we learn in vet school and probably what you learn at TAFE is rabbits really easily break their backs. Well, it's not quite as easy as you would you have been taught, um, but it is a possibility if you don't kind of support them, make sure their legs are supported and everything. Um, if you're hanging them or letting them like their back legs hang, then they can kick out and and give themselves spinal trauma. So you just got to be careful of that. Rabbit setup um, is a little bit harder than a ferret. But litter trays are still really important because probably about 70 to 80 percent of the patients are litter trained, and sometimes they won't go to the toilet if there's no litter in there. So it is important to put it in. Hay. Now, if we think about our food pyramid in rabbits, hay is the most important thing. It's like this, and it's on the bottom. It has to be ad libbed. They have to have it available to them all the time. Um, so even if you don't, if, when you set up a rabbit, if you're really really busy, and which I totally understand. As long as you put them in there with a towel and, a, and some paper on the floor, 
a bowl of water and a handful of hay, I'll be happy because everything else can be secondary to that. Um, box is pretty important to hide in because a lot of them like to hide away. Um, and then just having some kind of food in there is, and, and hay mainly is important. Um, but we do like to feed the oxbow pellets, um, so a good handful of that every day, and, um, and some fresh, fresh veggies. And you can sort of see how much they're eating. Um, if they're getting through all their food, then they don't have enough in there. So they're like cows, they just have to keep eating. Okay, so this is general important bits for all animals. Fresh food and water is really important every day, um, and fresh being the really important word in that sentence. Um, even if it kind of looks okay, they probably won't eat it if it's not fresh. That go, like that's the veggie stuff, um, and that's all species. Um, water and food bowls just need to be scrubbed out and not just refilled because you'll get the pseudomonas sludge. Um, and cages need to be wiped out with F10 so we don't get salmonella, psittacosis, you know, all those beak and feather, all those infectious diseases. Clean newspaper and towels every day um, for two reasons. It's important to be clean, but the other reason is so that we can see what they've been doing overnight or through that day so that we don't go, oh, is that poo from today? That's great. No, it was poo from three days ago. Um, and then you can check the door, the back of the door, for pictures that Caroline made um, for cage setup. So if, you, if you're having trouble... Um, so the exotics ward, like I said, biosecurity is our main concern and we'll just talk briefly about some um, zoonotic diseases right at the end. Um, but cleaning is, th these, I just thought I'd just go through what what would be nice in the exotics ward. Um, just making sure that the surfaces are all wiped down at least once a day um, and just restocking there's some of the things. Um, and I didn't get time to put the photos in that I took this morning of the actual ward. Um, but we've now got tea ports for all our, um, our IV catheters. We don't do a lot of IV catheterization, but because our animals are small and the IV catheters go in weird places, the tea ports are really great to be able to switch, you know, uh, move around and um, the long bit is good. So um, if I'm putting in an IV catheter, getting one of those ready t together with all the other stuff you normally do would be great. Um, I use a lot of Elastoplast and Fixamol <coughs> and not very much vet wrap because everybody is so tiny. If you use vet wrap, it'll constrict down on their tiny little limbs and cause their limbs to drop off. <laughs> so um, instead, I use those, those things when I'm putting on bandages and catheters. Um, and then in the cupboards, you'll find food. We always have these kinds of seed, um, pellets, and the Oxbow products. Okay, wildlife. Wildlife is just as important as everybody else, and I know I do it as well. If I'm busy, um, I find it hard to get into, wi into wildlife ward, I call it. Isolation is actually the ward. Um, but it is important for them to get food and water, fresh food and water every day as well. Um, any wild birds need to, or any wild animals should get set up in ISO straight away so that we're not having that potential of infectious diseases through the hospital. Um, and these are the ones that we're really thinking about when we're thinking about wild birds. Beak and feather disease, that's important for our other patients. Um, botulism, we've had a few cases of that in the water birds from Sydney Olympic Park. Um, while we can't get botulism from the bird, probably, um, we don't, you know, we want to kind of isolate those kind of bacteria into one spot. Salmonella is um, carried by almost anything um, if they've, they've got the infection. And salmonella can be really fatal. Certain species of salmonella are fatal for many species of birds. Um, and obviously we don't want to get parasites through our, like lice. Bird lice is a good one. We all get bird lice if we touch a bird with lice. So um, you don't want to be scratching all day. It's pretty gross. And flat flies, pretty gross. Um, yeah, so just into ISO and just give them fresh food and water and then hopefully um, I will get to them or somebody will get to them straight away. Both these birds have beak and feather disease, okay? So if you see these this kind of bird in the waiting room, wildlife or not wildlife, it just needs to go straight into isolation. <laughs> doesn't need to sit in the waiting room. Um, and that bird up there also has beak and feather. Can you tell why? Short tail, yeah. So lorikeets with beak and feather are usually very healthy, except that they have no tail feathers and no flight feathers. They're still very infectious. They carry that disease, so... Um, they can 
give it to everything else in the, wa- in the waiting room. Uh, so these are the three diseases that I thought I just should mention as um, <clears throat> biosecurity risks for us um, and probably haven't been talked about much because they weren't things that were commonly coming into the hospital before. Uh, Psittacosis is um, bacterial disease caused by the bacteria uh, Chlamydia psittaci. They keep moving it from Chlamydophila to Chlamydia, but currently it's in the Chlamydia family. It's not the same as Chlamydia. You can you generally worry about, I guess, but uh, it's the bird type, but we can still get it. Um, it is contracted by us by inha- and by other birds by inhaling feather dander and faecal dust, so the stuff that comes off their wings when they give themselves a fluff. Um, and it can be um, transmitted by that, that stuff getting onto your mucous membrane, so rubbing your eyes after touching that bird um, or having it on your gums. So it is important if we know, especially if we know that we've got a psittacosis bird, that we use proper PPE. And while it's hard to get this disease, it is possible. My nurse in my previous job had it, like got it, because we were seeing a lot of psittacosis birds. Um, pet psittacosis birds I try not to have in hospital for any length of time because I think it is a really quite a high OHNS risk. And so they are sent home for outpatient care. But um, there, there have been some suspect birds in the wildlife um, and actually, um, we call it psittacosis, thinking about it in psittacine, so parrots, um, but any species of bird can get it. So, um, you know, in um, crows and ravens, sometimes we see it, sometimes in pigeons, you'll see it with a big swollen eye, okay? Um, so these are the PPE things that we need to do. Um, really swollen conjunctiva, so red eyes, um, ocular discharge, nasal discharge, um, they'll be kind of fluffed up, that sick bird look. Yeah. Um, the symptoms in us are severe headaches and muscle aches, like you're getting the flu really badly, but then it kind of becomes this chronic disease and it can get into your lungs and end up with pneumonia. Um, and then the other two are um, when we're thinking about bat species. And um, you're, I don't know whether you commonly get bats before, but we've, we're seeing a few in hospital coming in on the weekends and stuff. Um, so lysovirus is the one that everybody talks about all the time, and that's the one that we can directly catch from bats. And it, um, it occurs in micro um, and macro species of bats, so flying foxes as well as the little tiny, um, you know, free tail bats and things. Um, so whenever a bat species comes into the hospital, um, wh- whether it's on emergency when I'm not here or, or, you know, on a day I'm not here, anybody who handles them, handles the box, handles the towels that they're in, handles anything to do with them, needs to wear gloves. So if the bat comes into the waiting room and the receptionist firstly take it and there's no nurses or no vets to come and get collect it. You just need to say, just give me a second, go and get some gloves, put on the gloves and then take the box. Take the bat directly to isolation. We don't want to find a bat in procedures room like we did one morning after quite a number of hours of being there. Um, straight into isolation and we've even got a little laminated sign now that can go on isolation door to say that there is a bat in there and that you need to be Um, vaccinated with the rabies vaccine to handle that bat. That's the other thing. It really should be somebody who's vaccinated with rabies, um, for rabies before, you know, handling anything to do with the bat. um, Wildlife carers are very lax about it, but it is easily easily caught, and it is caught through body fluids, so that includes saliva. So just touching the bat on the outside of its body where it's been licking itself clean and then accidentally eating something afterwards without washing your hands is, is a potential way of catching it. But being bitten or scratched are really um, high risk ways of catching it. And if that happens, if there's any bites or scratches, you need to go directly to um, a, a doctor and get post-rabies, back, um, post-exposure t- treatment. To avoid that, you need to wash your hands, obviously, using gloves. So if you're not actually touching the bat, just using um, latex gloves is fine. But if you are handling the bat in any way, using um, Kevlar gloves or any of the the welding gloves that we've got. Um, But we shouldn't also forget Hendra virus. Um, We know that Hendra virus... So Hendra virus is the other bat disease that we kind of get to a high level of um, 
um, media, I guess. It's the one that kind of goes from bats to horses and then it can go from horses to people. So we can't get Hendra virus, but we don't think we can get Hendra virus directly from bats yet. Um, but Hendra virus can go to dogs and cats. So we could get it. They haven't, they, um, they haven't shown it to be true yet, but dogs and cats do carry it well enough to potentially expose humans. But we're not sure if that is a, is, it can actually happen. So, but it is something to think about. So if you've had a dog, if, you, if a dog comes in that has been exposed to a bat, um, then the dog also needs post um, exposure rabies treatment um, at, a, at a veterinarian that does rabies vaccines. It needs isolation. It needs isolation. Um, and so we can isolate it briefly here, but then it needs isolation probably at home. Okay. Um, and if you get bitten or scratched by a dog or cat that has a known um, s sort of exposure to bats, um, I don't think that, well, you need to get checked out. Basically, um, the infectious disease people at RPA will probably be the be best ones to do. So, you know, we need to follow it up. You don't, just don't disregard it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so we just need to be really careful of that. Um, and we need to wash our hands between species because we don't know whether we can take Hendra from that dog to that cat. If... Um, if this does occur, uh, so uh, we had that experience a few weeks ago where there was a dog that brought a bat to the owners, Liz's um, <laughs> um, dad's dog or uncle's dog or something. Anyway, um, and the bat was brought in, but it was way too late to kind of send the bat off. It had been, you know, decomposing for a couple of days, so that wasn't really helpful. But the dog is having post rabies um, treatment. But what we need, we also need to do, I have, um, and I'm going to, organize a little sheet of paper but there is a phone number there's a emergency disease contact phone number that we can ring 24 hours a day if we suspect an emerging infectious disease um, or an emergency disease and these two diseases fall under that category this one is notifiable yes but we don't often notify to be honest um, because it's so common but um, and nobody like nobody really cares about it too much but if we had an outbreak of psittacosis then we would notify but these guys are something that we need to um, notify the, the um, emergency diseases hotline.